Hey everybody, it's Baker's Backyard for another installment of our lessons, continuing our discussion in AP US history. Uh, the, earlier, <clears throat> the earlier time periods are units. This is an introduction to unit two from 1607 to 1754. And we're gonna focus most of our attention today on the basic nuts and bolts of colonial settlement, mostly by Br in British North America. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of things regarding a lot of key names and places and, and things along those lines. What you will not see until our next installment is a lot of emphasis on things along the lines of, of conflict involving settlers and Native Americans and, um, and even some of the things that define their lifestyles. So stay tuned for installment two. With that being said, you know, the basic nuts and bolts of this lesson will be we want to further look at European uh, and their colonization. Uh, so we're going to build upon where we left off with Spanish settlements. We'll look a little bit at French. Dutch, and of course the primary big picture for really this week and next week is going to be our focus on Britain. We'll look at the effects of their settlement to an extent. You know, um, their settlement um, is a little bit different than the Spanish. Um, you could make some pretty strong arguments that their reasonings behind their settlements are different. So therefore, it's a, there's a lot of comparison and contrast and also causation, right, when you're looking at cause and effect like any time period has. We want to look at differences in, in British colonial development. How are things that happen in the southern colonies going to be different than the middle and also the northern or New England colonies, as they're also commonly referred to as? And when we think about that, we want to think about that in terms of social development, how geography affects that, political, and then, of course, also economic, which many times is based off of geographic differences as well. And then we want to transition our next <clears throat> lesson and also next week to this concept of developing a strong sense of self-government. And we get into the idea of, and we'll look at this a little bit next time, with how does this sense of mercantilism or these navigation acts that were not really well enforced by the British Crown, you know, how does that kind of start this process, amongst other things, of this self-government, along with other things like, you know, the, the um, <clears throat> the British, you know, system of, of representation that they allow, like in the, the Virginia House of Burgesses and some of the other things. So let's go ahead and get started. So key um, elements of colonial geography that we want to keep in mind is the importance of waterways. This is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea about important things that are going to define the lives whether it's trade or whatever, social movement as well, migration, different patterns that you saw on the previous slide. And because of that, key port cities and also you know, places that develop. The South cities are usually gonna be smaller in size, but that does not necessarily mean that they are not, they are not important, especially when it comes to trade and also you know, when it comes to Charleston and you see a lot of attention brought to slave trade from different parts of the world, then you notice a lot of emphasis there, along with places like Savannah, um, Philadelphia, of course, in the middle colonies, and then New York City, and famous Boston, right? Obviously, the harbor that became very important for the, uh, the colony of, uh, of uh, Pur the Puritan colony of Massachusetts Bay, and of course, we know it's important today. Go Red Sox if you like the Red Sox. Uh, regions, we want to be able to distinguish between the geography of regions. If you're thinking about the southern colonies, you're really looking at anything from, a, from about Maryland, as far south as Georgia, as they would say there. Middle colonies are going to be basically Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and also New York. And then anything basically above there is going to be New England. When we think of New England, We'll talk quite a bit about the development of places like, you know, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Plymouth, um, of course, Rhode Island, which was kind of an offshoot of that, and also Connecticut. But the one thing that we have to keep in mind, guys, is that a lot of us in our lives before this period of time, we've heard of the, the pilgrims. You know, we celebrate Thanksgiving every November, at least a lot of us do. And the one thing that we forget sometimes is that British colonial settlement also has a lot of other effects and a lot of other places that have a lot of influence that is important to keep in mind, okay? And the big question here is, how does geography impact the development of these colonies? 
So we're looking at that theme particularly. It is, uh, and it, is it the most significant factor that impacts colonial development? So let's go ahead and get started. So if you're thinking about, okay, well, what does basically the settlement of you know, European North America look like? This map here gives you a pretty decent idea about British settlement, which is gonna be in the green, French settlement, which as you can see, there's a lot of forts, a lot of areas that are settled, uh, Montreal, Quebec, you know, some of these areas here that you can see as well, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and then of course these areas that are kind of like in the reddish orange, if you will, is obviously what we've already talked about last week with the establishment of Spanish settlement, right? So that should not be a big surprise when you're looking at the settlement of Florida, parts of the Caribbean, and then of course, as you can see, a large part of this area as well, okay? And so these empires are all gonna be competing. Remember that big idea of Christopher Columbus was his first voyage is really gonna lead to almost like a jump start, right? Of a lot of these different settlements and also of course voyages and ventures, which is very, very important, okay? So what's the big deal here? The French, the Dutch, the English, they're gonna join the Spanish in settling the Americas. Um, and they're gonna have some wars. They're gonna obviously fight and uh, basically, you know, again, try to basically show who's kind of like the top dog. We talked about last week how there's a very big emphasis on this idea of a balance of power in Europe. Who is gonna basically hold a favorable balance of power when it comes to military strength and political development and economic development? And guess what? A lot of these you know, countries are gonna have a lot to say about that or these even nation states as they're becoming known as, okay? So a little bit about the French. Um, one big thing keep in mind is that the trade and not conquest, if you need to stop and um, take a few things down as I'm speaking, feel free to do that. And why is that important? Because when we're talking about the trade with the French, we're basically talking a lot about the idea of furs, the beaver trade, right, is gonna be pretty important, okay? And so what we notice is that the French, you're not gonna see a huge influx of French moving over to the New World in a similar way that you would notice like the, with the British and also to a pretty strong degree, the Spanish, okay? And so what we notice is that the French are making alliances like with the Huron, which is a tribe that's you know, very important to, um, to their, uh, to their um, development. And so what we notice, excuse me guys for that, is that you have these different alliances between these different tribes that are going to be popping up, okay? One thing that you can make an argument about that's interesting is that you don't really have that strong sense of representative assembly and government as much with the French settlement in North America, right? So you can make a really strong argument that the British settlers are gonna be in a much better position to what to have self-rule and, and and also you could also argue that they're developing this mindset of self-rule differently which of course we know is going to lead to a strong revolutionary mindset right and we'll look at what other people have to say about that negative effects of french settlement disease yes you continue to uh, continue to see that trend as well as the warfare amongst native american or american indian tribes Okay, so as far as settlement, you know, you're looking at, again, you know, Samuel de Champlain is probably going to be your most well-known of the French settlers, or at least the French um, voyagers that come over. And what do we start to notice? We start to notice that they're making a lot of settlements that are forts and other kinds of settlements along the Mississippi River and other things along those lines. Louisiana, you know, Baton Rouge, places like that. Of course, New Orleans, okay? Very, very important to keep in mind, okay? But as you can see here, just a quick note, that it's a very small group of people, 300, right? So that's a small group compared to the numbers that we'll eventually see coming over like in the Great Migration from parts of England, settling different parts of the new world on the part of England, okay? 
as far as the Dutch, um, a lot of you guys might know the story about, you know, the, uh, the Netherlands gaining independence from Spain. Keep in mind, this is 1581. I don't know if you need to memorize the date, but keep in mind, this is about 100 years, a little bit less than that, actually, after or before, excuse me, the famous um, you know, voyages of Columbus happened before then. And they're going to be very similar in some ways. Fur trading became big, you know, along the Hudson River, which is an important geographic uh, piece to keep in mind. If you look at the date here, 1609. So that's only a couple years after the eventish, uh, I'm sorry, the eventual settlement of, of Jamestown by Britain. Okay. And then, of course, New Amsterdam, which is eventually going to become under British control and becoming, of course, um, what we call New York is going to become pretty important. Okay, what you'll notice is that some of these European powers and settlers were more likely to have more favorable relationships with the Native American population. You see that with the Dutch to an extent. You see that with the original settlement of you know, colonies we'll look at here in a moment with you know, um, Pennsylvania, right? And then even places like uh, Rhode Island, right? With the settlement of Roger Williams. Okay, so if you take a look here, you're basically looking again at the basic nuts and bolts of the settlement of a lot of the Europeans in this area. And you can see this map does, I think, a little bit better job, guys, showing us some of these Native American tribes. You know, you can see the Iroquois, the Delaware, the Shawnee. Okay, Ottawa, okay, Miami, et cetera, Sioux over here. So we're moving further westward into current day, what you would associate with, um, with the Midwest. Back then it would be the older Northwest once we became a, you know, um, more, more toward a country. Okay, and so you notice again all these different areas. These, these countries are trying to basically establish trade with a lot of these people, right? And that leads to a lot of settlements and cities, and a lot of places are gonna have a very important influence moving on. You can also see a few of the larger cities that are going to be developing in British North America with Boston and New York, Philadelphia, and then you can also see Charleston right here, okay? So we wanna keep that in mind. So we see a lot of development. This chart here, as you, or this map here, as you can see, takes us a bit further into time period two which we'll spend more time on in sessions three and four. Okay, so the question is, why would the British, you know, want, or the English, want to basically colonize the New World? When you start to look at the original settlement of places like Jamestown, and then, of course, when you look at other ones too, well, the answer to that is a lot of this is going to be driven by economic incentive. Okay, now keep in mind, guys, those of you in my class last week, we talked briefly about complexity, and we'll build upon that. But guys, when you're looking at colonial settlement, you always want to be thinking about different factors, reasons that impact it. Okay, yes, you've got economic. Yes, you've got social. And yes, you've got political. Okay, but the question that might be good for us to consider, just throwing this out there, guys, is are all of those at the same level of what drives a certain country or even a certain group of people within that country. All right, for those of you that are riding on this eventually, the complexity thinking is gonna allow you to develop not only a better line of reasoning, but also a stronger amount of thesis support that you can use to really go in several different directions. The key thing is taking a firm position that you can, of course, defend with evidence and, of course, analysis. Okay, so the English, again, you've got several things here. Wars with France, a lot of different things like con conquest of Ireland, right? And then the influx of uh, Spanish silver. Now, you have a lot of economic problems that are developing here. Okay, the enclosure movements. Okay, not everybody has access to land. Right. So if you're somebody who's not maybe in the nobility, right, or let's say even somebody who's, you know, not the firstborn son, right, that primogenitor idea that's not on the slide, you know, you might be looking for an opportunity to really gain something that you're not, that you don't have, or that you might not even have access to for either a period of time or maybe at all. 
okay? And so you've got people that are paying high rent, social conflict, okay, et cetera, et cetera. I remember going to Scotland just a couple of years ago, and I was talking to one of our tour guides there, and this was probably 2009 or 10, perhaps. And I remember asking, you know, how much is a, a typical home here? And he told me, and I was like, man, you know, that's a lot of money. How do y'all afford homes? And he said, a lot of us don't. We rent. Okay. And so what do you notice? You notice that a lot of people are going to start to really desire, even now, but especially back then, the opportunity to go abroad. Okay. And so again, you know, we talked about a little bit last week how, yes, you are going to see a transition throughout this process from stronger feudalism to more capitalism, but that doesn't mean that you still don't have eventually class conflict that's developing. All right, we'll look at that quite a bit when we, when we study, especially things like the, um, the, the Bacon's Rebellion, you know, which is in the, about 1676 in colonial Virginia. That, that's what we'll look at in one of our future sessions. Okay, and so because of that, right, what becomes a popular system of labor once Jamestown and eventually Virginia is settled, and that is, of course, indentured servitude. Okay, to my knowledge, you don't really hear as much about this in Spanish colonies, right? You hear about encomienda, and then when they kind of, I guess, in a sense, phase that out, but they still have quote unquote wage slavery. Okay, so, but indentured servitude is going to be a very common system for the British. And of course, we know that slavery will, will infiltrate there as well, along with the head right system that we'll come back to. Okay, so what happens with the settlement of Jamestown? So you've got these concepts of joint stock companies that are popping up, right? Kind of like these businesses, people that are, you know, trying to get support from, um, you know, different groups, but they have to have obviously permission or a green light, if you will. To basically settle and so who do they have to go through they have to go through the king or the monarch okay and so they're setting sail for north america and of course where are they where are they trying to go well they're trying to get over to an area that can be settled okay and so they actually do 1607 is considered to be that settlement of the first permanent settlement of british north america now you hear stories about the attempts at places like the lost colony of Roanoke, okay? And so eventually, they end up having a settlement, but it's not going to be an easy one, okay? So maybe pause for a second, guys, and think about this. What is going to be the geographic challenge of settling in a place like this area of Jamestown, okay? And... You know, it, it might not be the easiest thing to see here, but it's going to be very swampy. It's not going to be the best land. You see a lot of, you know, areas where people are going to really have trouble succeeding because of mosquitoes and things like that. So this is not the best place to probably get a colony started. Okay. In addition to, you've only got, what was it? I think it was like 50 to, to a few more people that actually settled this right away. And they're all men, right? So it's not going to be like in the in the in the the northern colonies of New England where these people are coming over in family units. So therefore, it's going to be very very difficult for a lot of these men to obviously grow the colony or to actually have population growth. All right, I think I saw several years ago in a source that the average age of a settler in Jamestown when they first arrived within the first few years or so was 33. Right, like if you think about it, I mean that that's you know, that's pretty young, right? I mean, relatively speaking, okay? And so where, where would you start? You know, how do you get this colony started, okay? Well, Native American relations are not going to be something that the early settlers are going to have the most success with. We'll look at that more later. But what do we notice? Eventually, you have the famous uh, individual by the name of John Smith. Now. Smith is an interesting guy, you know, because pretty much you can make a really strong argument, guys, that he is going to almost, I don't know if the right word here is single-handedly, but he's going to have a very strong role in basically helping this colony to survive, okay? Going through the starving time, 
eventually. And he was, you know, some people would say he was kind of a, a harsh guy. I would say somebody who wanted people to really pull their weight, right? Thou shall not eat if you don't work. Okay. And so a lot of these colonists that were not used to maybe rigged labor and so forth, they're going to be like, man, this guy is mean. He's nasty. He's ugly. And what happens? He eventually keeps the colony from collapse. But he has to go back to England eventually, right? You can see here he, you know, he is involved in some some Native American conflict, um, and what happens is that they have another leader that comes over, Lord De La War, with two R's, and pretty much his last name guy says it all. Very harsh. You're going to see several plots and wars that happen under his leadership that we'll look at a little bit later. Not going to be the best thing, but the colony does survive. And basically what's gonna happen is that you continue to see 1619, you see the first women coming over to the Jamestown settlement, which is important. So these men are gonna start to settle down, have families, of course, uh, families meaning kids. But another thing that we'll look at in our next, se next session is the downside of this is definitely gonna be in the same year you're seeing the first slaves being brought over to Jamestown. Okay, but before then, what are we seeing? We're seeing more of that indentured servitude that's actually coming over. Okay, so it's pretty important. Okay, down the line, Virginia is gonna develop into a colony that is heavily dependent on tobacco. And if you think about it, guys, the Southern colonies, as they become known as, Virginia is going to become a royal colony around 1624. The Carolinas, uh, which will eventually break into North and South Carolina. Maryland, which we'll look at briefly in a moment. And then also the last colony of Georgia that's going to be settled in 1733. You're going to see um, in some of those places the development of plantations, large-scale farming that's going to have a large social effect, economic effect, et cetera. Okay, and so what you notice is that this tobacco introduced by John Rolfe, so you know, a lot of you guys are familiar with the story with him and Pocahontas, et cetera. Okay, so cash crops. This is going to become a big signature point of Southern colonial economic life. Tobacco, rice, indigo, those kinds of things. Okay, so I don't know if you need to memorize all this, but obviously you can see clearly, guys, that you're looking at a huge, huge change within about a 14 to 15 year period of time. Okay. So there's some money to be made. Okay. And so what happens? Well, we need more workers. Um, indentured servitude does not completely die out, but it certainly is going to start to, to lose some support and also some, some people coming over. So you see the introduction of this head right system which was basically giving land to people that would fund you know, folks to come over and work and things like that. And again, that's where you continue to see this, um, this tension between the, the Native Americans and also, of course, the British settlers. Okay. And so really quick, one really good thing that we'll look at more later, this kind of a building block toward independence and and uh, the kind of thinking that we talked about earlier is the idea of this establishment of the House of Burgesses. You'll notice the same year that the first women came over and the first slaves were introduced, you're going to have this, uh, this legislature that is going to give these colonists a degree of ability to have some self-rule. Okay, One of the biggest things that people automatically, I would say, jump the gun with whenever you hear the term, no tax taxation without representation, okay, you know, there were some colonists, I'm sure most of us are like, we don't like taxes, you know, it takes less money of our paychecks, but government needs to function. A lot of colonists were like, well, if you pass them through our local representation, which the House of Burgesses is an example of that, then, you know, we can at least be more accepting of it. Why? Because it's, it's basically showing that we are having some voice in the process. Okay, so they can make laws, they can levy taxes, 
et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then you'll notice again, the introduction of slavery. Okay. So again, guys, just one quick thing. So we're seeing, you know, how does geography affect this? Well, climate, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Very important. Now, this is kind of a big deal we're going to spend a lot of time on, but a lot of people are like, well, Mr. Baker, okay, where it is, you know, we've talked a lot about economic and, and geography and the degree political, you know, what about religion, right? Because we'll get to that in just a second with um, the, um, with the New England colonies particularly. And the answer is that you do have some pretty strong support for the Church of England, right, through taxation, okay? And so what do we notice is that you see Virginia developing into, you know, this example of a royal colony, right? That's going to have a lot of influence directly by the crown. You can see this, guys, by the king appointing a governor. That's what royal, um, royal colonies are. You've got a king, of course, from England, a monarch, and he or she is going to be like, this is the governor of this colony. Right. And so you'll notice that to be pretty important. Okay. What happens with the settlement of Maryland? Well, again, this is going to be set up as a proprietary colony, which basically means that you have land that's being given to a person, or in the case of the Carolinas, a group of people that's actually going to be, again, given by the king, right? In this case, King Charles. Okay. And so why do we call Baltimore Baltimore? Eventually, you've got you know, Lord Baltimore, um, that obviously is going to be given a lot of this land. Now, you got to remember, England, by this period of time, has already become a Protestant nation because you have this Anglican church that's formed over a disagreement between King Henry and the Catholic Church over, you know, a divorce and things like that. And so you do have this technically Protestant Reformation that's affected Britain, not as soon as it did other countries um, or areas. But what do we notice? This gentleman is Catholic. Okay, so he's not Protestant. So his thought is, well, let's just make a colony that's going to provide a degree of religious protection for the colonies, or the colonists, excuse me. By the way, a lot of these people that are moving into Maryland are actually moving from some of the original settlements in Virginia. All right, so they're moving into that area. And so a lot of them are bringing ideas about how to farm, you know, of course, tobacco. They're bringing ideas, you know, and things along those lines about religion. You know, there's going to be a clash eventually between Anglicans that are coming up there. When I say clash, I don't mean necessarily large scale wars or anything, but certainly conflict and ideas. And so what does the legislator of Maryland do to provide protection to especially Catholics and religious groups. This is something to pause and get down. The Act of Toleration of 1649. Now, as you can see, this eventually will be repealed just a few years later, but it does provide a, de a, a strong degree of religious protection to Christians. In fact, I believe it was, it was worded is that people that, ha that basically accepted the deity and the divinity of Christ, right? In other words, him, him being considered God, then you were basically protected, right? So that technically included both Catholics and other Protestants. It did not include, you know, some people that were Jewish that were not, you know, Messianic Jews, right? So that's important to keep in mind, okay? And if you're kind of wondering why does this change happen, all right, it's something that we'll look at a little bit later. Okay, so pretty much what does the settlement of the Chesapeake region look like by, as you can see, about 1650, right, which is a, a little bit less than a half a century later, you've got Jamestown, St. Mary's, Baltimore is not in this picture there, Richmond, Virginia, okay, and so you're noticing, again, the development of this amongst the presence of other Native American tribes and villages, right? So you can obviously see the handwriting on the wall that because of land and different things, there are going to be some significant differences between 
the English settlers, and of course, a lot of the Native Americans. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind is that when you're looking at um, some of these things, guys, with class rebellion that we'll look at later, you do notice that a lot of this goes back to differences between you know, some of the Native Americans that are living in the area. Okay, so the question is, all right, so we've kind of jumped around a little bit with, with settlement from some areas um, that are in, you know, parts of the Chesapeake. We'll come back to the South in a second. What about the area that most of us have already heard of? You know, the area that were settled, was settled by the pilgrims and the separatists and, you know, obviously, you know, the Puritans that wanted to, to purify the church, by the, which, by the way, was different than the separatists. Okay, well, you got to know a little bit about the background of the Protestant Reformation. What's the name that probably comes to mind first? You got it. Martin Luther. All right. Names like uh, John Calvin, right? This idea of this doctrine of Calvinism. Okay. And so you've got this, this reformation that has a very important effect. And Europe is going to go through a state of change religiously, quite a bit of it. Okay. And so what do we notice? So you've got these, these people that are forming these different Protestant groups and denominations and things like that. And I just referenced, guys, the Anglican Church. Well, the Anglican Church, yes, it is going to be technically Protestant because it's not headed officially by the Pope, like the Catholic Church will be, the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. And so who's going to have a lot of pull with the hierarchy of leadership? It's going to be the king. And the issue is, is that you've got a group of Protestants, the pilgrims or separatists, that are like, you know what, we think that there's some doctrinal needs for change, right? In other words, they're like, hey, yes, technically we agree with us being Protestant, but we think that there needs to be reform within the church. And when they don't see the, uh, the commitment to reform, then they're like, we're just going to split. And that's kind of what the pilgrims or the separatists as they were also known as are going to do. Okay. And so again, selling of indulgences is big. The idea of Calvinism and predestination is very much going to define a lot of Puritan ideals. Okay. And so you'll notice that again, the Puritans are not really happy with the stay with the status or state of the Anglican church either. However, the big difference is they are not ready to completely separate from it, okay? But they want to purify it. They want to basically try. They still have some faith, pardon the pun there with religious connection, guys, but they still have a faith that they can do some reform. Pilgrims, not as much, okay? So this is a little bit later than Jamestown, 1620. So keep your context in mind here, okay? And I think it's very important, guys, for us to understand that organized households and moving to America and family units is big. The ability to bring family with you, to have families, to have husbands, wives, they have kids, they have the ability to have offspring, they're married communities, okay? And so they're, they're going to expand their population quite a bit faster than what you would see when you're looking at Jamestown, okay? And here's a cool thing, guys, when you're looking at the idea of commitment to self-government, but also the idea of not separating from the crown, this Mayflower Flower Compact that was actually formed literally on the Mayflower, the ship, and we're going to read that for our documents this week and we'll break it down but basically guys the thing is is that it's very easy if you're not careful to be like well they're declaring independence from britain that's not true all right what they are doing is they're making a sincere commitment to basically community right in other words you know we want to have a community that is wholeheartedly committed to the idea of governing in the common good, or what some people might would call the public interest, right? So they're already trying to make it clear that when we settle 
Plymouth Rock, we are a united front to support each other. And you're going to see that in a lot of different ways. Education being one of those. We'll come back to that in the next session. Okay. So as you can see here, Pilgrims arrive, not an easy winner. Okay. And a lot of you guys are familiar with the idea of Samoset, Squanto, Wampanoag tribe. Now, there are going to be obviously some conflict here eventually. We'll look at that a little bit more in our next few sessions. Okay. But what you do notice is that eventually you are going to have the pilgrims being able to establish a longer term amount of, of settlement, obviously. And, and that's important. Remember, it's very important to make it clear that the Pilgrim settlement in Plymouth is separate from the Puritan settlement in, of course, Boston or Massachusetts Bay. Okay, and so they come around later, the Puritans. This is about 10 years later. Again, purify the church. Now, city upon a hill is gonna be this big concept that basically illustrates what we were talking about with a commitment to Christian community. And John Winthrop, who's probably one of the more well-known of any of these settlers, who's going to be very important, writes a lot of cool things. His uh, influence to, basic, uh, to settle this colony is immense. And the idea of the city upon a hill kind of protecting the sense of religious community that they're very committed to. Okay. As you can see, just a quick statistic here, um, one third of them will travel with families. More prosperous or better supplied ba basically means that they're gonna be in a better position, guys, to have um, um, not immediate success, but certainly it's work to get the colony established. But they have families, they have people around. Their economy is going to be quite a bit different. Why? Think of location, okay? Think of things along the lines, the cooler climate, okay? So what are you going to have? You're going to have a lot of people that, yeah, they farm in smaller units, but they're going to have to figure out how to diversify their economy, okay? Shipbuilding, furs, okay? So therefore, Boston as a port, we're not saying that the other port cities don't matter, but Boston as a port becomes really, really significant for the settlement of this colony. And eventually, of course, you know, really that region. Okay. They're gonna be self-governing. We'll look at that more a little bit later. The Puritan or Great Migration, as you can see, is gonna be a sizable group of people that comes over in large numbers. And as you can see here, migration was made easy, easier by land availability due to population of American Indians dying of Colombian exchange diseases. Okay, so guys, what you do notice, again, another similarity with the effects of European settlement compared to that of the Spanish and even the, the French as we looked at earlier, you notice that yes, unfortunately, disease is gonna ravage a lot of these communities, as will warfare, okay? And again, religion is gonna be one of the most significant influences, excuse me, with their colony okay so just a couple of things um patriarchal family will come back to basically ma very male um dominated as far as like society women of course had roles as well keep in mind but it's very important to keep that in mind and then the question is okay well what about the rest of New England, okay? You don't hear as much about New Hampshire. You hear some about Connecticut we'll come back to. But probably one of the more, I would say, very interesting settlements is gonna be Rhode Island, AKA Rogue Island, which by the way, is not a term of endearment, okay? And why does Rhode Island get settled? Basically, as you can see here, you have a gentleman by the name of Roger Williams, and eventually another well-known person by the name of Anne Hutchinson. They reject a lot of the Puritan church, its doctrine, some of its, you know, teachings, things like that. 
Okay. And so what happens? The Puritans are like, okay, you got to go. They're not very tolerant to ideas or ideals, guys, that are not consistent with their own. Okay. So it's almost like that. It's our way or the highway kind of mentality. Okay. So what does Williams do? Well, Williams is a Baptist. And what does he do? He says, okay, I'm going to find my, find my own colony. So he does. That's, that became known as Rhode Island. And you've got Providence. Again, guys, key cities. You want to keep in mind, most of these colonies have a very important city that, or cities or towns, or if you will, that define them. Okay? And so religious toleration. Quakers, Baptists, Jews. Okay? They do have a separation of church and state there which was not as, you know, common in society that you would have seen in Puritan New England. Okay. So very important to keep in mind too, good relations overall with the Native Americans. And guys, if you think about it, if he opens up the opportunity for religious freedom, what does that really mean for the colony and, it, and kind of like the big picture of it? It's going to be one, if not the most democratic of the earlier colonies, certainly one of the leading ones. Now, I live in North Carolina, and I can tell you that North Carolina develops, as we'll see here in a second, a very similar kind of feel to it, right? A more democratic kind of um, thing. And my question, guys, to the students would be, you know, what effect do you think that that would have on the colony, its culture, politically, socially, right, et cetera, et cetera. It's pretty important for us to keep that in mind, okay? And so anyway, so Anne Hutchinson, this idea of, you know, antinomianism, you can look that up if you want to, but the idea that, you know, her, her opinion, guys, here, first of all, you don't see a lot of this by a lot of, you know, females in our, in our colonial societies. Um, some of that starts to happen, you know, really more toward the revolution. If you look back at the uh, writings, you know, of um, Abigail Adams and things like that. Okay. But this is a big deal, right? This is something that, you know, would not have been as likely to happen in like New England. I'm sorry, not New England, but in colonies like Puritan, Massachusetts Bay or Plymouth or whatever, because of the nature of, you know, the way that the, the religion affected them in different ways. Okay. Um, she believed that God's grace alone could ensure salvation and challenge others who oppose this position. Okay. So this is something that again is not going to be accepted by everybody. Is it about, you know, doing good works or on the other side of the coin? Is it about, you know, obviously just, okay, God is, is graceful. Okay. And then one thing, guys, that kind of leads us a little bit into the latter bit of, of, of content on Southern colonies, and we'll wrap it up with middle colonies, is a lot of times we forget that Britain has a pretty important settlement in the West Indies, right? We always hear about Span the Spanish settlements, okay, uh, Bahamas, et cetera, okay, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, um, some of the other areas, but... We also need to understand Britain, all right? Probably the most well-known, Barbados, okay? And you are going to see an emphasis on cash crops, sugar cane, which also becomes big in, in some other parts of the Americas, but particularly, you'll see that here, okay? And indenture servants and enslaved Africans provided the labor, all right? So again, you're seeing that trend as with Native American labor being a little bit different than that of Spanish colonies, okay? And this is kind of, you know, as you can see here, guys, um, we haven't looked at a lot of visuals, but the idea of, you know, you can see the slave labor that's actually being used to uh, produce this. Um, those of you that like uh, baseball quite a bit, um, I know this is technically, a, um, I think, a Spanish settlement, but if you ever have heard of the Dominican Republic being really big with sugarcane production and also baseball, um, I read a story a few years ago that a lot of these young baseball players are caning. They're doing sugar cane when they're young um, 
and they, you know, they take a few hours off to go play baseball and then go back and do the same thing with the hope that a lot of times the baseball will be their break. Now we know that that doesn't exist then, you know, but what does that mean? It means that there's got to be a reason why sugarcane is still a pretty significant part of their economy. Okay. And so what happens is that, okay, so you have this settlement and this development guys of this British, um, these British West Indy areas. And what do we notice? This is going to eventually infiltrate into the settlement of the Carolinas. Okay. The Carolinas were originally a settlement that was a huge colony. It was given to eight noblemen. What happens is eventually, of course, the colonies will be separated into North and South Carolina. They're going to have somewhat distinct traits that define them that we'll come back to if time allows in our next few sessions. Okay. But the reason why this is important is that, again, you'll notice another major port, okay? And the downside of Charleston, guys, is that it's not just going to be a port for cash crops. It's unfortunately, as you can see here, going to develop into a port that you'll notice, you know, for the slave trade, okay? And you notice a lot of modeling of plantations to those that you would have seen in, of course, the West Indy area of Barbados. Okay. So again, just keep in mind that you've got a big variety of different social developments that are happening. So we will come back to that in our next session. Okay. And this kind of shows you a little bit guys of what we're talking about. So Barbados, which is where I have my cursor, you'll notice again, English possessions. Okay. So again, you notice obviously uh, over time, this will change. And you're seeing, again, a pretty, you know, a pretty big amount of, um, of mileage it takes to get from Barbados to, as you can see, Charlestown, or we would call that Charleston. Okay. So very important just to keep in the back of our minds. And then to wrap this up, we haven't really talked about the middle colonies. Middle colonies, some people would say is almost like the best of both worlds. You've got a middle climate that allows you to, you know, not only do some farming that's going to be um, a little bit more on the cash crop side, but you also have the ability to have industry, all right? So building things, right? Ships and all these different things that will uh, put you in, in a good position, okay? Uh, New Jersey and New, and, and New York, New York will focus most on. Um, you do have an interesting settlement that eventually became, uh, became British, okay? And then last but not least, as far as the, probably the most influential of these colonies and middle colonies is gonna be what we call Penn's Woods, AKA as we call it, Pennsylvania, okay? Again, proprietary. William Penn, the king is like, here you go. Okay. And what does he do? He establishes a colony that's going to be known for its diversity. Okay. Um, it's settlement of the city of brotherly love in Philadelphia. It's going to be pretty open to different religious ideas. As you can see. Thing I thought was interesting, guys, is that he actually created pamphlets in many different languages. Okay. Pennsylvania Dutch, you know, German, uh, et cetera, okay? To basically try to almost like appeal or shall we say kind of like advertise his colony for those that wanted to come and settle it, okay? And let's make uh, no mistake, guys, it is going to have a lot of Quaker influence to it, okay? Um, and so again, you notice that this colony is going to develop quite a bit. Okay, Philadelphia being right there. You notice the importance of um, some of the, uh, the other settlements that develop, some of the Native American groups. Eventually, as you can see here briefly, Delaware will become, as you know, a lot of you know, is a very small state. Um, so you're going to see a lot of movement, a lot of migration, a lot of a variety of ideas 
that are going to impact the settlement. Okay. So the population of this colony will go up. As you can see here, there are there is going to be some, some conflict. For my students, I realize this has been a little bit of a longer introduction. The next one will be more conceptual, a few points to kind of uh, talk more about. But I want to remind you that you should be trying to take your quiz on chapter two, which has a lot of themes related to today and some of the things you're reading um, by the end of Tuesday. If you prefer to wait until your second class day, which will be Thursday for you all, um, just keep in mind that that is, um, that is an assignment that you're waiting to do until later in the week, okay? Um, I would definitely make sure that you previewed your, your unit two objectives. And I would also make sure that between now and Thursday that you have looked over your fabric short answer question introductions. We will cover that in our, in our breakout session for office hours on Friday and also try to do your documents assignment. As always, feel free to email me at bakerd at franklinacademy.org if you have any questions or concerns. Otherwise, I hope that you all have a great one. Hope you are staying safe. And I look forward to seeing you hopefully in class next time. Have a good one and take care.